Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. So why don't we just collectively say thanks to our moms right now through our applause in all our rooms. Thank you moms for being there, for supporting us, for praying, for nurturing us along the ways. It's a great thing that you do and a great responsibility that you have. At the same time that we're cheering and saying thanks, I do want to be sensitive because we're well aware here that we've got a, a, a large congregation and there's, uh, anytime there's a lot of joy for something like this, there's, there's also a corresponding amount of pain. And so Mother's Day can bring up some sadness and um, Maybe that's because maybe this is your first Mother's Day that she's not here anymore and you feel a sense of loss because she's not here anymore. Or maybe because you, you couldn't be a mom or you haven't been able to be a mom and there's a sense of sadness. Or maybe even when we cheer for moms, something in your soul is like, yeah, but you know, my mom didn't show up the way that lots of moms did. She just didn't come through. And so Mother's Day can be painful, and we're very well aware of that. And, and so um, I think what I'd like to do is just pray one more time. Um, let's just pray for you. I won't ask you to identify yourself, but you know what's going on in your soul and in your heart if there's pain. Why don't we just uh, join our hearts together once more in prayer in all of our rooms. Lord, we're just coming in behalf of those whose hearts are a little um, downcast on Mother's Day. For any of the reasons I mentioned and probably a dozen others that I didn't even think of to, to say out loud, but there's pain there and there's loss there and um, we wanna be sensitive to that. We're thankful, Lord, that you are the friend of the wounded heart, that you bind up our wounds, that you move us forward, that you give us new hope, that you carry us to the new thing. I pray, God, that you would do just that in any such heart here today that's feeling that feeling on Mother's Day. Won't you just take our faces in your hands and lift our eyes to see you, Jesus, and to gaze upon your heart and your smile and your love for us, even if or where uh, we couldn't feel that smile in the natural realm with uh, whatever maybe has gone on or is going on even now. Won't you help us to see you, Lord, that we might find hope, the seed of hope deep in our heart, sustaining us, that comes from you, Lord Jesus. We pray all of these things in your strong name. Amen. Well, today is a special Mother's Day in the history of FaithBridge because for the first time in 18 years, we actually have the opportunity to have a Mother's Day sermon from a real life mother uh, here uh, on our staff. Lou Ann Riley joined our staff several years ago. She's a very gifted, uh, strong leader on our lead team. She oversees all of our adult ministries and discipleship and is a gifted communicator. And I think what you're going to discover, uh, whether you're a mom, whether you're not, whether you're a female, whether you're a, a male, dads, this is not a message that you'll easily tune out. By the end, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. She has a word for all of us today, and it's a powerful word. So let's welcome Lou Anne now as she comes to bring us God's word. Thank you, Pastor Ken. Well, happy Mother's Day. Before we get started, I wanna tell you a funny story about my two kids, uh, my two crazy boys. Uh, we have a picture here, yes. Can anyone else relate with like trying to get a really good picture on Easter and ending up with something like that? Uh, or just me. So my boys have been asking a lot of questions because we've been talking about Mother's Day a lot in my house because of this Sunday coming up. And so one of them asks, so what's Mother's Day? all about anyway. And I said, you know, it's a day where we honor moms for all the things that they do for you, like laundry and cleaning up and making your dinner. And one of them said buying groceries and taking us to school. And then my little smarty pants chimes in and says, and wiping our bottoms. Yes, 
and wiping your bottom. So happy Wipe Your Baby Bottoms Day, everyone. And if you see a mom today, thank her for all the glory-filled things that she gets to do on a daily basis as a mom. So today we're gonna be in the book of 1 Samuel. It's an Old Testament book, and the ushers are gonna come forward now and hand out the Bibles. Raise your hand if you need one. Uh, They'll be happy to give it to you, and if you don't have one, take this one home today as our gift to you. So when I was 24, I was interviewing for a promotion with my job. And as part of this promotion, I had to fly to our corporate headquarters in Minneapolis, Minnesota to do this round robin type interview with these corporate executives. And so I was young and I was intimidated and I was overwhelmed when I walked into this room of older executives and they began to ask me questions. And then they got to one question that I can still remember today. They asked me, tell me about a time that you wanted something that you couldn't have. And I drew a blank. And the look on his face was, Luann, really? You can't think of anything in your life that you wanted that you couldn't have? Something you failed at or something you were disappointed by? And I really couldn't. I was 24 and I was young. And at this point, things in my life had gone fairly easily for me. And what he said to me, he said, oh, just you wait. (laughs) You haven't lived long enough because something will come along that you want, that you will not be able to have. That is life. It is full of disappointment. And you know what? A couple years later, His words came back to me, and I found this to be true as my husband and I sat across the desk from an infertility doctor wanting to have a child and not knowing if that was going to be possible for me. My first experience with wanting something, desiring something that I didn't know if I was going to be able to have. You know, Tim Keller, he's a noted pastor and preacher. He says this, No matter what precautions we take, no matter how good we try to build our lives, no matter how healthy or wealthy or successful or comfortable we try to be, something will come along and inevitably ruin it. And I bet you guys are probably sitting there thinking, you're not telling me anything that I don't know. In a room this size, I bet there's plenty of disappointment, life plans who didn't go the way that you expected them to do, desires that you have. Maybe you came today with that same real desire that I had to be a mom and that hasn't happened for you yet. Or maybe you came today and it's your marriage. Maybe your marriage is not what you want it to be or what God intended it to be and you desire, you desire for it to be different but it's not. Or maybe you desire to be married and that hasn't happened for you yet. Or maybe you have a friend or a family member, perhaps even yourself, who you desperately desire to be healed from chronic illness or addiction or mental illness. You keep asking God, how long? Or maybe today on Mother's Day, you're thinking of a child your child, who has not gone the way that you would want them to go, who has made choices that would not be the best for them, and you have been praying and asking God, asking God to fulfill this desire to bring him back. The thing about these desires are, these are good desires. These are not sinful desires. These are desires that we know to be good and true and right and in line with God's heart for us and our relationships. But yet, they're oftentimes left unfulfilled. And we're left broken and hurting and there's real sadness. You know, today, I wanna talk about that. That's the question for today. What do we do? How do we do it? In a world that's full of brokenness, unfulfilled desire and unmet expectations, how do we live out our faith? How do we remain faithful to God in the face of heartache and disappointment? 
So on Mother's Day, I wanna look at the story from a Bible of a woman, of a mother, a mother who is quite familiar with the pain of unfulfilled desires, but a woman who God teaches us what faithfulness looks like in the face of unfulfilled desires. So we're gonna talk about Hannah. So Hannah's story is found in the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. We're gonna be in 1 Samuel chapter one. We'll start in verse one, it's right at the beginning of the book. So there was a certain man from Ramathame, a Zephite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Helkanah, son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zeph, an Ephraimite. He had two wives, one was called Hannah and the other Peninnah. Peninnah had children, but Hannah had none. Year after year, this man went up from his town to sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests to the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Peninnah and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, and the Lord had closed her womb. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. And this went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Her husband Elkanah would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than 10 sons? Once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life and no razor will ever be used on his head. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, how long are you gonna stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, go in peace. And may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She said, may your servant find favor in your eyes. And then she went her way and ate something and her face was no longer downcast. Early the next morning, they arose and worshiped before the Lord and then went back to their home in Ramah. Elkanah made love to his wife, Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel saying, because I asked the Lord for him. So when we meet Hannah here in her story, we find out a few things about her. She's a wife, and we find out early on that she's desperate to be a mother. So in Hannah's time, there was this cultural significance on having a son. And because Hannah couldn't have one, her husband had taken a second wife who apparently was having no problem producing offspring, which only led to further grief and anguish in Hannah's heart. But we see that Hannah is a faithful woman because despite this pain, despite these unfulfilled desires, she makes the trip year after year to worship and give sacrifice at the local temple. And every year she struggles under this weight of this unfulfilled desire to have a child. She's weeping, she's broken, and she's hurt. And today I wanna to show you three truths in the scripture that Hannah teaches us when faced with the heartache of unfulfilled desires. And the first truth that Hannah teaches us is that our unfulfilled desires should lead us to pray. Pick it up again in verse nine. Once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly, and she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look at your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, 
Then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. So I picture Hannah at this dinner. So the dinner that she's at is a celebration dinner. It's a time of rejoicing once you've given sacrifice in the temple. And she's watching as her husband deals out portions, first to the woman who can have children and her children, and then to Hannah. And even though he gave, gives Hannah a double portion, she's still so hurt that she can't eat. So I imagine her sitting there watching everyone else celebrate, growing angry, maybe bitter, hurting. What was happening in her heart? I don't think we could blame her if she railed out in anger about the injustice of her situation. I don't think we could blame her if she got up from the table and went home and got in her bed and cried and put the covers over her head. I don't think we could blame her for the hurt and the pain that she was feeling inside, that it would distance her, that she would want no part of the celebration dinner that's happening at the table. Think about how easy it is for us to let our unmet expectations, our disappointments, our unfulfilled desires to distance us from God, to allow us to grow bitter or angry. And it happened to me the longer our journey with infertility went on, the farther and farther away I felt from God. I was struggling in my faith, and I just remember that like every month they would tell us, this is the month, it looks good, this is it. We were so full of possibility, and then every month it would be no. And my heart, in my disappointment, was growing bitter and hurt, and I remember that I began praying less and less, and I would leave my Bible closed more and more, and I began making excuses to not have to go to small group. And in my pain and in my hurt, God was the last person that I wanted to talk to because he could fix it, and he wasn't. And I was telling a friend in that season about how I was feeling, and I said to her, I just kind of summed it up by saying, God is just so distant from me right now. He just feels so far away. And she spoke truth into me. She reminded me of a truth about God. She told me, Luann, God never leaves us. God is faithful. He is always there. It is us. It's us. We're prone to stray. We're prone to pull away from God or to become distant. She was right. I was the one making the choice not to pray or not to hear him through my, reading his word or not to go to him. But Hannah, Hannah makes a better choice. In the darkest night of her soul, Hannah chooses not to let her disappointment separate her from God, not to let her pain move her away from God, but in that unfulfilled desire, in that hurt and that pain, she gets up and she moves towards God to pray. It says she rose from the table and she went to the place where she felt closest to God, the temple, and she prayed. She allowed her unfulfilled desires and her hurt and her pain to bring her closer to God. And she prayed a prayer. I bet she's prayed this prayer a thousand times. Lord Almighty, remember me and give me a son. She allowed those unfulfilled desires and that pain and that bitterness not to take root in her heart, but to send her to God to pray. And I don't think that that disappointment and the pain and the hurt that we can feel is the only thing that keeps us from praying when we're broken. I think another reason that we don't pray is because we have this idea or we feel like that we have to present ourselves in a certain way before God, that we have to clean ourselves up and be bright and shiny and be on our best behavior before we can come to him. But Hannah teaches us something different. The second truth that Hannah teaches us is that we can bring our desires honestly before the Lord. 
in verse 12. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard and Eli thought she was drunk. And he said to her, how long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking beer or wine. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Hannah, she pours her soul out honestly before the Lord. She comes to him. She doesn't clean herself up before she goes. She gets up from the table and she goes to him and she cries out. And I have a friend who's told me about the struggles in their prayer life. She told me, when I am sin, in sin, or when I'm disobedient, or when I'm not doing the things that I know that God would want me to do, I'm not living the right way or treating people the right way, then I can't go and pray to him. I can't tell him. I can't let him know. Then he'll know that I'm a failure. He won't know that I'm strong in my faith, that I'm following him and being obedient to him and all the things he's asked me to do. So I have to get it all back under control, make sure I'm doing the right things, and then I can come and pray to him. And I don't think she's the only one. Sometimes I do think we struggle to be honest before the Lord. Hannah's prayer, it would have been so much more righteous in front of the priest if she said something like, dear Lord, I know what is best for me. I know you want what's best for me. I would love to have a son, but if I can't and that's your will, that's fine. I just want to glorify you. And that would be a good prayer, but it wouldn't have been honest. It wasn't how Hannah felt. It wasn't where she was in her brokenness. Hannah, in her brokenness, she throws herself down and begins to cry and begins to pray and to pour out her soul. She wasn't worried about what she looked like in front of the priest or what she looked like in front of other people. This wasn't a practice prayer. She didn't write it down before she brought it or a prepared speech. This is a desperate woman who is crying out to her God. Hannah gives us permission to bring our authentic, messed up, broken selves before the Lord. So we moved to Texas in 2008. And when we moved, we were in the middle of our journey with infertility. And because of the move, because of the stress that the infertility treatment had caused on us and my body and the condition of my heart, uh, we decided to take a break. And we weren't really sure, honestly, if we would start back. But by the spring of 2009, uh, we were ready to try again. We had a new church. We had a new community around us. I was much more rested. We had a new doctor. And so we said, all right, we'll try it again and see what happens. And after four long years, we got the news. I was finally pregnant. Uh, I have a picture here of the day that I told uh, my husband, and of course it's at a Mexican restaurant because all good celebrations have to involve chips and queso if you live in Texas, just so you know. And we were Texans now. Uh, and then I got my next surprise. We were pregnant with triplets. Yep. Yeah, we were shocked too. And uh, a lot of people joked and said, uh, I guess we've been praying maybe a little too hard. Um, but we were excited. Uh, we were excited. We soon found out that we uh, were carrying two boys and a girl, Beckett, Eli, and Ruby. And my pregnancy was high risk. Uh, with all multiples it is, but also with some medical things I'd gone to to get pregnant. Uh, it was a little bit more risky. And also I'm small. And so they were on a mission to make me gain a lot of weight to be able to carry three babies. And I was on this like high protein thing where I had to eat so much protein in a day. And I still cannot look at cottage cheese without feeling nauseated. I'll never be able to eat it again. Um, and so uh, my pregnancy was just this mixture of joy and uh, fear over the risk. And we were halfway, a little right at the halfway mark when we had an ultrasound with a high-risk doctor. 
And so everything with Beckett checked out great. Everything with Eli checked out great. And then when they got to Ruby, I knew without a shadow of a doubt that something was wrong from the look on the technician's face. He uh, quickly excused himself to go get the doctor and the doctor came in. And as I lay there holding my husband's hand sobbing, she gave us the news that uh, Ruby no longer had a heartbeat. You see, here's the thing, when you become pregnant or a planned pregnancy one, mostly, is from the moment that you get that little plus sign, your heart is invested. You begin to love and you begin to dream and you begin to plan and you begin to hope. You know, my husband and I joked a lot that uh, we would finally have something to do with all those Barbies my mom made me keep that are in our attic. <laughs> uh, and then we laughed about, and we joked about how she would never stand a chance to have a date because she would have two brothers in the same grade as her. And my husband uh, began to dream and think about what it would be like to walk down the aisle with her one day at her wedding. And so when Ruby died, those hopes and those dreams for our daughter died too. Her passing made my uh, pregnancy even more risky. So there was a very real fear and real risk that my body would go into labor, that her passing would signal uh, things to start moving. And so uh, I would go into labor. I began to see doctors every few days. Her passing also put me at risk of blood clots, and so um, that could uh, hinder the boy's growth as well. And so the doctors told me, there's a very real risk that you could lose them all. And I struggled. I would get up in the night because I couldn't sleep. I would get up in the night and I would get this blanket and I would get in the chair in their nursery, which was almost empty at the time, and I would just cry and I would cry and I would sob until I almost threw up. In the darkness of those nights, the darkness of the night, I had my first real crisis of faith. I remember telling God, this is not what I signed up for when I decided to trust you with my life. This is not fair. We have prayed, people have prayed, we have done everything right. How do I know that you won't take these two, that you won't take these two? How, Lord, how could I ever trust you again? And in the night, he spoke some words into my soul that have become a defining moment in my faith. It's been a turning point. It's been a time that I come back to over and over again. He let me cry, let me rail, let me be angry, say all I needed to say. And then in the quiet, he spoke into my soul and he said, I lost my child too. I gave him for you. You see God? He sent his son to die. He chose that. He watched his son die this brutal, horrible, painful death on a cross for us. Why would any parent do that? Because that is how much he loves us. And he showed me that night that I love you. You don't serve a God who is not familiar with heartache and pain. We don't worship a God who hasn't experienced unfulfilled desire. The Bible tells us that he is deeply acquainted with our grief. I came to him that night broken, angry, hurt, fully prepared to walk away. And he gave me hope and he gave me peace. Much like Hannah found when she threw herself before him and cried out. The third and final truth that Hannah teaches us is that true peace is not found in having the answers. It's found in having God. In verse 17, Eli answered, go in peace. 
May the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She said, may your servant find favor in your eyes. And then she went her way and ate something. Her face was no longer downcast. Early the next morning, they arose and worshiped before the Lord and then went back to their home in Ramah. So here's Hannah. She gets up. She wipes her eyes. She's no longer downcast. She leaves and she actually eats. She gets up the next morning and she worships. But why? Nothing about her circumstances has changed. At this point in the story, she has no idea that she will one day receive the son that she so desperately wants. She has no idea that next year won't bring that same hurt and that same pain of unfulfilled desires. But she gets up and she goes to eat and she worships anyway. Because Hannah found peace, not in the answer to her prayer, but in the presence of God. She brought those unfulfilled desires in her heart before him. She poured her soul out to him and he granted her peace. She left changed because she had been in his presence. It's a peace that comes from not knowing or having all the answers, but it's a peace that comes from having God's presence in our lives. In Hannah's culture, a woman without a child was an outcast. And so the pain that uh, we feel, that women feel on Mother's Day, women who can't have a child, who have lost a child, that was an everyday cycle of pain and shame and questioning for her. As the wife of Helcana, she was a failure. She could not do what she was meant to do. And the only thing that could redeem her from her position of shame was a son. You and I, we are not that much different than Hannah. We are like her in more ways than one. Not only do we know the pain of unfulfilled desires, but we can't change our circumstances one single bit. We cannot do what needs to be done. We cannot save ourselves from sin and shame and this cycle and this pain and this brokenness that we're in. Only God can do that. And God did give Hannah a son and redeemed her relationship with Elkanah. But to give you and me a son, for us to have a son, his son had to die. He had to lose his, but he did it. He sent his son Jesus for us so that we could also be redeemed, so that we could be brought back into full relationship with him. And we have these desires and we're so desperate to have them filled. And we just look in all these places all all over the world, turning to quick fixes, trying to find satisfaction and fulfillment and peace. And they fail us, leaving us again broken and hurt and disappointed. But God has heard. He sees our brokenness and he sees our disappointment and he sees our heartbreak and we know that he's moved by our plight because he sent his son Jesus. And we can rest in the truth that even if we never have all the answers, even if our desires are never fulfilled, that we can look to Jesus and know that God has heard our cries and he has answered them. Through the death and resurrection of Jesus, we have more than peace. We have hope. We have the hope of eternity. I have the hope that one day my desire will be fulfilled. I will know my daughter. I will hold her and my family will be together again with Jesus. You know, the um, interviewer I met at 24 was right. (laughs) No one in this room will get everything that they want. There are no guarantees in life and our lives will turn out different than planned. We will have heartache, we will be broken. And I have asked God why (laughs) over and over again. And I wonder if any of you are asking why too. Why can't I be a mom? Why can't I have my desires filled? Why does Hannah, why did Hannah get her desires filled and get a son? Why did Luann get two? Why not me? 
And I don't have the answers for your situation or your circumstance. But I, like Hannah, have found that my peace doesn't come from having the answers. My peace doesn't come from knowing what will happen. My peace comes from knowing God. My peace comes from my relationship with Jesus. You know, when I've been on this journey and I've learned that putting my faith in Jesus, trusting Christ with my life, doesn't mean that I'm not immune to the heartbreak and the sorrow and the brokenness in the world. It doesn't mean that I don't have to go through hard things and that I won't struggle. But it does mean that I have the presence of God in them. It does mean that he gives me everything I need to face them. It does mean that he uses them to draw me closer. It does mean that in the darkest nights, he is there giving me peace and giving me hope. And if you're here today and you don't know the peace and hope that comes from knowing Jesus and having a relationship with him, do not leave here today without it. God doesn't always answer the prayers the way we want them to or when we want them to. But as believers, we have hope because we don't place our faith in the answers, but in the God who answers. Let me pray for us. Father God, we come to you this morning and we worship you and we praise you because you made a way. God, On Mother's Day, it's so hard to even imagine the pain of losing your child, but choosing to lose your child, you did that for us. That love, there's there's no other love like it. That's how much you love us and how much you desire us. God, I know in this room right now that there are people who are hurting, who are disappointed, who are struggling with desires, God, who know real pain and real heartache. But God, you say, come to me, bring those to me. And so God, in this moment right now, in the quiet of your seat, I want you to just bring that desire to the Lord. I'm gonna give you a minute to bring it to the Lord and just honestly tell him how you feel. Now in this moment, I want you to ask him for peace. God, I pray, I pray for every person that is in this room today that is struggling, God, that they would leave knowing your peace, that peace comes in believing and Jesus and not in the answers, God. Won't you grant us the peace and the hope to face the disappointments and the brokenness of this world? God, I pray your peace and blessings upon them. And if you're here today and you're thinking, I don't know this hope and peace that she's talking about. I don't know Jesus in that way. I have been looking all over the world, looking for different places, trying to do this all myself and I can't anymore. Why don't you bring those before Jesus right now Why don't you tell him that you see that you're broken and that you can't do it on your own and you desperately need him? Why don't you trust him with your life right now? He's waiting. He doesn't care about your past, your shame, your history. He wants life and freedom for you. Why don't you ask him for it right now? Say, Jesus, come into my life. I trust you with it. Father, in your word, you tell us, <laughs> in this world, there will be struggles. There will be pain. But to take heart, because you have overcome the world. And so it's with that truth and with that peace, 
God, that I pray that we would leave here today drawing only closer to you in our times of need. God, we thank you for your son, Jesus, the son you gave for all of us. And it's in his precious name we pray. Amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hi, I'm Pastor Dan Slagle, and welcome to another edition of Postscript. Today we are with Lou Ann Riley, who brought us just a terrific Mother's Day message uh, entitled The Peace of God's Presence. Welcome, Lou Ann. Thank you. It was a great Mother's Day message. In fact, I, I said over on the West Side, I think it's the best Mother's Day sermon I've ever heard. Thank you. Uh, very, very well done. It elicited a, a range of questions, mm -hmm. all the way from those merely seeking information to some pretty serious theological uh, issues. First question has to do with verse 11 from uh, 1 Samuel chapter 1, the reference to no razor touching uh, the child's mm -hmm. head. What is the meaning of that, and is there any connection with Samson? Okay, so... What they're referring to, or what Hannah's referring to in this verse, is a religious order of the Nazarite. And in this religious order, there were things that they couldn't do. Shave their heads. Right. Uh, their hair had to grow long. They couldn't eat grapes. There were uh, things that went with this religious sect. And so what I think is so interesting in this verse is sometimes we apply it as... Uh, God, we will raise our children. We will train them the way you want them to go. Sure. We will impart these things. But she's saying, I'm not just going to commit to raising him in the Lord. I'm going to commit to giving his life yes. to yeah. this religious order. So th so when she's saying, no, razor will go to the head, he's going to be a Nazarite. And he'll eventually, she she does give, give, him, him, give yeah. him up where mm -hmm. he's raised by Eli and the, the other priest. Sure. Um, and so that's the connection there that she's talking about when she's praying. Right. The uh, sort of the overarching emphasis of being a Nazarite was to be set apart. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it uh, shows incredible faith and courage on mm -hmm. Hannah's part that she would even entertain that that thought. Right. The child that she was so desperately praying for wasn't a child that she raised to right. adulthood. Yeah. It was a child that she gave back to the Lord. And then through him, eventually we see Jesus come yeah, that's right. because of her faithfulness. Yep. Uh, yet, yet another reason why she's such a remarkable lady. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, questions get a little more challenging. Uh, in verse 5, it says, The Lord closed Hannah's womb. How are we to understand God's role in her infertility? By extension, how are we to understand God's role in our suffering? Okay, so let me try to answer this maybe uh, two ways. First, let's look at what it said, the Lord closed her womb. Um, what we what we do know is that a, a lot of times Hebrew writers will use uh, figures of speech or things. Um, at that time, they didn't have the medical diagnosis that we have. Sure. You know, I just yeah. was talking to a woman who was telling me her story, and she was saying what her medical diagnosis was for infertility, and I was like, "That's the same one that I had." Uh, they didn't have that. Um, and so the Lord closing a womb was often a way that they described infertility. They didn't have the word infertility. Sure. Um, and so we can see that as a description. But as it fits into this bigger question that we're asking about, how are we to understand God's suffering, um, God's role in suffering, I, I think it continues to go back to what we were talking about today. In the Bible, God doesn't give us a clear answer to that question. Yeah, never, never a satisfactory um, you one. You know, we anyway. see in the book of Job this intense book of suffering of what Job goes to goes through. And at the end, I mean, he does cry out, "Why, why, mm -hmm. why?" And all all people tell him all kinds of reasons why. Sure. Uh, he gets to the end of the book, and God does speak to him, but he never tells him why. 
He never reveals that to him or speaks to him. And I think in some ways, that's how we have to approach God and that we won't have all the answers and we won't understand. But what we can identify is that God knows suffering and yes. that he has walked that and he chose that. And so we know that our suffering doesn't, it's not in vain, it has meaning and that he's there with us in it, but we can't clearly ever, I don't think, and, and if we could, I don't know that that would be God. Yeah. The way that he is. Um, and so what we can know and rest assured that we see over and over and over and over in scripture is that he's close to the brokenhearted. Mm -hmm. He's always in the midst of suffering. He's always bringing peace and hope and healing and times of mourning, he is there. Mm -hmm. And so we can trust that. Yeah, that is the continuing theme that uh, though we may not have all of the answers, we do have the presence of God. That mm -hmm. is the promise that he will be with us in the difficult days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. All right, one more question came in. How can we know if your desire is selfish or if we should even be pursuing it? Example, fertility treatment versus adoption, or being at peace with your family the way it is, or trying to make a business work versus pursuing something else. In other words, how do you know when to keep praying and working and hoping and when to just say, okay, it is what it is? So I think what I've learned in my experience is that the desire that we're talking about today, we're talking about good desire. We're not talking about a sinful desire to have an affair or adultery or to sure. all these other things that have boundaries around them that would, would be a very clear answer. When we're talking about good desires, like wanting to have a child or start a family, get married, um, pursue a new job. Um, these answers aren't the same for every person. Um, I have found that uh, when we're looking at something like for myself, when we were going through infertility, uh, it was important that I always had people that were speaking truth to me mm -hmm. uh, because I could find at times, and I've, and I've spoken about it before in other sermons, where it had become the thing, mm. my obsession. I wasn't talking to God about anything else. Right. I wasn't pursuing anything else. I wasn't really open to anything other than this thing that I had. Almost like an idol. Yeah, like an idol. It can become an idol. Um, and I think when we're bringing these things before the Lord and we're evaluating in our life, we have to see where, what is the condition of our heart? Is our heart, is our affection for God and we're loving Him and we're pursuing these things? Or is this the thing that we continue to pursue without any open ears or eyes that God might be leading us to something to something different. You know, I didn't talk about it in my sermon, but um, even after we lost uh, Ruby, I continued to want more children. And so the Lord surprised us with three pregnancies after that, which I lost all three. And then I remember my husband and I sitting down again with a fertility doctor who said, you won't be able to have any more children unless you go through all of these treatments mm -hmm. again. And I walked away with a peace right there of knowing like God is telling me to be content with what I have yeah. and that if he wants to grow my family, it'll be in some other way. And I had that clear peace right there that like this, this time is a, it's, it's no for me where maybe it was yes before. Um, being in his word, listening for his voice, having people around you who speak truth to you and to help you navigate mm -hmm. these things, having wisdom in your life um, can help us answer some of these questions that we might have about our desires. So it's really not just one thing that's mm -hmm. gonna give us the yay or the nay. We have to put ourselves in a place where there are any number of factors informing our decision. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's good, very good. Yeah. Again, such a good message. Thank you. Uh, I know it ministered to many people during the service, and I'm sure as we uh, put the message online, it will continue to minister to many, many more. Thank you. Great job. Thanks for being with us for another edition of Postscript. We'll see you the next time. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.